welcome to the AI and Big Data in Finance webinar. We're delighted to have two amazing speakers today. Um, we have Will Kong from Cornell, who will present his paper, Alpha Manager, a data-driven, robust control approach to corporate finance. And we also have Wei Zheng from Emory, who will be uh, the discussant. Will is going to have 30 minutes to present his paper. Um, after 15 minutes, I may briefly interrupt uh, in case the audience has any um, clarifying questions. And Wei will have 20 minutes uh, for her discussion. Um, afterwards, we are going to open up the floor for questions from the audience. Um, as audience members, please uh, submit your questions in the Q&A, and then I will call on you during the questioning part. Um, as a reminder, please be mindful uh, with your comments, the presentation and the discussion will be recorded and together with the slides, they will be posted um, on, on our website. After the main part of the webinar, we're going to have an unrecorded session uh, discussion where everyone in the audience will have the opportunity to be upgraded to panelists, um, and then we'll have, uh, um, yes, the opportunity to exchange with Will um, and Wei. All right, so Will, um, the floor is yours. You can have 30 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Let me just share my screen. Um, all right. Um, it's a great, great honor to... Um, to be here to present um, this this uh, kind of line of work uh, with my co-authors, uh, I'm just trying to uh, move the screen a little bit. So, um, you know, the the paper itself is going to be quite preliminary, and my goal is actually not so much uh, to present a paper and show you know we have a we have a perfect solution to a key question. Instead, actually, I just want to share with you you know what we have explored to show that tapping into the um, recent advancements in AI and machine learning, we can make good progress, um, not only in asset pricing, but also in corporate finance um, to, to answer important questions there. And in a way, I'm going to pose many questions or ask many questions and show some initial attempts to answer them. And uh, my, my goal is really to invite all of you to ask more questions, right? Um, kind of uh, using the, the framework. Now, um, what I'm going to do is I'll start with an overview of DRL, deep reinforcement learning, which is a underexplored paradigm um, that's behind most of the AI developments over the past 15 years or so, um, and, and show how we can use it to answer some of the questions in finance. And um, I'll start with an application in portfolio management um, but I'll quickly move to this copper finance application um, of a manager. And for the main paper that I focus on, uh, is John work with Marilo, my colleague here, and also um, uh, Luo Feng, uh, Joe, who's at uh, NYU Stern as a PhD student. And uh, let me just, okay. So uh, we all know that um, there are many reasons why we would like to use machine learning or AI in, 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 in the finance field. Um, the data generating process that we face, you know, have certain distinguished features. Um, some are related to science and engineering, but the rest are more unique to social science or economic um, settings. And because we have to deal with all these high dimensionality and linearity, we necessarily have to use kind of newer tools um, in machine learning and AI one concern that we used to have is that they, they tend to overfit. And now we actually know um, that's lesser of a concern. Um, we, we do have the virtue of complexity, so on and so forth. Nevertheless, I think it's important to, you know, utilize these tools and architecture uh, with good economic motivation and guidance. And importantly, interpretation is still a big challenge in the space. So what have we done uh, so far? Uh, in asset pricing, I think we've definitely explored many of the shelf models for prediction exercises. That's what most machine learning uh, packages were designed for. Um, not necessarily for finance, but in general, prediction tasks. We've also introduced uh, important uh, structures of economic restrictions into the framework. Um, but most of the studies still utilize supervised learning. Right, for example, to recover pricing kernel. Now in corporate finance, we've done a lot of textual analysis for sure, starting with simple bag of words, 
and then moving on to the word embedding model, topic modeling, um, and eventually, well, not eventually, but more recently, large language models, right? Utilizing the, the power of transformer and attention-based networks. Uh, for non-textual applications of machine learning and corporate finance, um, there are fewer studies. Uh, for example, uh, Leah and co-authors have looked into, you know, selecting board of directors or VC investments. Um, way and co-authors have looked into, you know, uh, how uh, conference earning costs um, are going to be affected by the fact that there are uh, people possessing the textual side. Um, again, that that's a little bit more on the textual uh, analysis. But overall, all the applications so far tend to focus on training the model through examples that supervised learning or using some sort of unsupervised learning to figure out the uh, relationship in the X variables. And I would argue that's not the core theme in AI over the past two decades, uh, at least 15 years. Um, if we think about the waves of um, AI, we are really in the episode where we see great automation of solving complex problems. Um, and, and the algorithms are showing intelligence in some way. I would categorize this as we are providing them complex problems or sophisticated goals. And the models are just enlarging the space that we use to model the world of financial markets. We are allowing the algorithm to search intelligently in a enlarged modeling space to achieve a goal. And in order to tailor that to finance and economic applications, I'm just going to make that goal a economic goal, right? And there are various ways to search within that large modeling space. You can do a full search, but that's not quite computationally feasible. So far, the AI field has explored mostly heuristic search through reinforcement learning. I'm going to come to that in a little bit, but there are alternatives that uh, that's not so much explored by computer scientists. For example, tree-based method in um, Svetlana and uh, Marcus have all contributed to that. Um, and I, I have a few papers uh, related to greedy search using tree-based models, uh, which presumably could be even more interpretable because the models tend to be smaller and more transparent. But that's not the focus for today. Um, I'm just going to, uh, move to reinforcement learning. And um, so what is reinforcement learning? Heuristically speaking, that's how we learn as humans typically, right? We interact with the environment and we receive feedback. We typically optimize some, some objective. Now, if you believe in the reward hypothesis, which says any goal can be formalized as maximizing a cumulative reward, then we can use this to solve many problems. You know, flying a helicopter, making a, a robot, uh, robot walk, you can define what is the reward and the action space. And I'm going to show you a quick example of managing a portfolio. You can define the reward. It could be return and shop ratio, and the action space could be the portfolio combinations. Um, there are finer details to how to optimize a reinforcement learning model. Um, these are finer engineering details. I don't think that should be our focus. Um, so I'm going to stay at um, a high level. At a high level, reinforcement learning is really just data-driven version of dynamic programming and stochastic control. You can view that as a multi-arm bandit problem in the dynamic set as well. So basically, we have an environment that provides the states of the system, states of the world, and the agent taking the states as given are going to take a action. That action will generate a reward for the time being, but it also affects future reward in the sense that that action could change the environment. Um, and by taking that action, the agent could be exploring and learning more about the environment. Once the agent has taken the action, the environment will evolve from current state to the next state. It's going to generate the current period reward and the system basically iterates. That's, that's the basic idea. And um, so reinforcement learning is the framework behind self-driving alpha goal, um, chat GPT, large language models, so on and so forth, uh, machine translation. And another key innovation that happened 
uh, not too long ago, and that's behind most of the uh, large language model would be the self uh, self attention attention network um, mechanism, which is essentially just a more flexible way of modeling time series inputs. Right when we read um, an essay uh, or we try to translate an essay, it's reading um, each word or each sentence in the essay and trying to find the relationship of that particular sentence with every other sentence, so that word with every other word. Um, and we let data tell us, you know, what type of relationship would be more important instead of our traditional ways of specifying, oh, we're doing AR1 or AR5 um, process or we're using a fixed time window. Now, as promised, I'm going to start with a quick uh, mentioning of an application to portfolio management. And this is something that we actually did back in 2019, 2020, applying transformer and offline reinforcement learning for portfolio management. And here I emphasize offline, because if you interact with the environment online, it's going to be very costly. And you have to put in the capital in order to, to learn from the interaction. Now, this, this is, um, if we are not mistaken, probably the first large model in finance. We had over 10 million parameters. Um, but it's still way smaller than ChatGPT, for example. So it's really medium-sized model. And the, the idea is typically we optimize a portfolio through two steps. The first step is to understand the return, expected return distribution. And the second step is to construct the portfolio. The second step now has become more tractable, whereas the first step of you know, minimizing pricing error, recovering the, the uh, pricing kernel, um, is still very challenging. Now, one uh, uh, additional challenges include that um, we typically don't model how our actions interact with the state. Right? Price impact is just one example. Um, if I have a objective uh, of managing a fund, I want to maximize returns, but uh, subject to never losing 50% of the fund, then whether that fund is surviving is a state variable that's affected by the action. Right? And that's neither um, in our typical market data or you know, firm data. Um, in order to deal with all this, we can apply a direct optimization, taking the inputs and directly outputting the optimal weights for some objective that a portfolio manager has in mind. Um, and there are earlier attempts to that. What we are really doing in this study is just fully operationalizing the uh, direct optimization procedure. You can give me very flexible objectives, and I'm going to specify a very flexible modeling space using deep learning. And the training is going to be reinforcement learning. I try some parameters. If it's doing well, I search more in that parameter space. If it's not doing well, I search away from that parameter space until my model converges. Um, so how would that work if we Take it to managing a portfolio, uh, you know, in the U.S. public market uh, space. Um, here, I'm just showing you the architecture of of a portfolio. Again, that's not my main focus for today. Um, all that is doing is it's using transformer to extract the information in the time series. We also add a cross sectional attention network to extract information in the cross section, and after that, whatever um, scores that we can generate, we're going to use it to build a portfolio. And if that score-based portfolio construction leads to a high performance in the objective, for example, auto sample shock ratio, we're going to search more in that parameter space. And when we apply this to US equity, um, let's say using auto sample shock ratio with monthly rebalancing as our objective, this is just a performance table and bigger than Q10, Q20, meaning we're excluding um, small and illiquid stocks, so on and so forth. So, so why am I talking about this? This is, a, this is an example where we are enlarging the modeling space and let the econometrician to explore historical data to figure out what would be the best portfolio management strategy. Now, the, 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 the paper that I really want to focus on takes that approach to a corporate finance setting. In other words, we're going to treat corporate finance problems as a stochastic control problem. But let me provide a bit more background why um, this might be helpful 
with what we already know in corporate finance. Well, we have a big literature in corporate finance and there are many challenges uh, we, we still face. Uh, for example, using the models that we have, uh, we can only explain about 10% uh, in sample R square in firm outcomes. Um, and that's mentioned in uh, John Graham's AFA presidential address. And there are various other challenges, such as the, the theory models that we have are typically static or not allowing firms and the marketing environment to interact. Um, and and that's, that's great for understanding certain mechanisms, but it's not producing predictions or counterfactuals that uh, would be very useful for corporate managers. At the same time, we do have abundance of data on corporate finance uh, or corporate outcomes. We also have all these powerful algorithms. So the idea is, can we take a data-driven approach? Now, now here's the main idea. If we think about all these approaches or modeling of the environment of, of financial markets of a firm in general, we typically have two goals, right? One goal is to understand the underlying economic objective. The other goal is to explain empirically outcomes or produce counterfactuals or uh, produce you know, optimal policy recommendations for the CEOs and CFOs and reduce form models, whether it is theory or reduce form empirical work, do a great job in understanding the underlying mechanisms. But it tends to be about local mechanisms, right? Policy change is typically low dimensional. Um, identification comes from parameter regions where we had that natural experiment or um, you know, uh, particular IV. Whereas CEO, CFOs are making daily decisions in very high dimensional space, combinations of actions um, in parameter regions that's outside what is historically identified or causally identified. Um, that, that leads to a particular challenges for reduced form model. If we think about empirically, uh, how we explain outcomes of providing counterfactual recommendations. Now, structural estimation takes a more holistic approach, right? We, we kind of start with tractable theory models um, and believe that's the true description of the world. And in that sense, everything is causal. And we try to you know, calibrate the model, provide counterfactual and policy recommendations. Again, that's a restricted modeling space because we have to look at theoretically tractable model. We're not allowing so much the interaction of actions and the market environment. We know there's a, a big feedback literature on that as well. So uh, can we do a data-driven version of structural estimation? potentially allowing more possibilities, whatever patterns that are giving us, we're going to try to capture that. So that's the, that's the main idea. And, and to do that, we, we also have to recognize copper finance decisions are really stochastic control problems. We're doing high dimensional dynamic control. We are not sure about the environment as a manager. Uh, we're taking actions to see how the market is going to react. And we're learning from that, all while optimizing a policy for a particular objective. And that objective could be you know, share prices, enterprise value, or even ESG, so on and so forth. Um, so so why, why is this a, you know, it sounds too, too good to be true if this works. Uh, necessarily, we're doing a lot of extrapolation and interpolation. So relative to reduced form approach or structural estimation, why would this empirically perform better? Um, that's not guaranteed. We do worry about overfitting. We do worry about the possibility of data shifts, right? The data generating process could have been different with a new uh, data set. So uh, that's where the robust control part will come in. And I'll come to that in a little bit. I'm going to take a short pause to see if there are questions. Well, I didn't see any clarifying okay. questions. Just a reminder to the audience to ask your questions in the Q&A part. Thank you. Sounds good. In that case, I'll move on. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on the, on the contribution. Safe to say that we try to provide a complementary framework to existing approaches in corporate finance. 
And one, one thing that we really want to do, and I'll probably get to that towards the end, is are there ways to incorporate what we learned in reduced form models, theory models, structural estimation, and put all of them together uh, in, into one framework so that you know, the, the findings and insights are no longer segmented or fragmented, right? And uh, to uh, robust control, this would be a more data-driven uh, approach and application of robust control. Um, and um, th there are some uh, contributions we try to make to the AI side. Um, this is an example of model-based offline reinforcement learning um, and the use of ambiguity or robust control techniques will be new in that space as well. So um, let's start with the typical data sets we have, right? Uh, from compute stats, from CRISP, and if you want to incorporate some macro states, we can do that. Uh, here, we're just using four indices from the Chicago Fed. Those are composite indices, but you can use alternative macro variables as well. And, and the idea is for a firm, uh, we can think about the state variables right, of the system. Some are internal, right? What's the leverage of the firm? You know, what's the number of employees, so on and so forth. Some are external. What's the uh, unemployment rate? What's the inflation rate, right? What is the aggregate market risk? Um, so using all those as state variables and their changes and lagged versions all as inputs into our uh, neural nets, which I'm going to introduce in a bit. In terms of control, um, or decision variables by the managers. Uh, you know, th there are more that we could include, but th these nine are uh, the, the typical ones that we talk about, how managers are changing uh, leverage of the firm, making investment decisions, or cash savings or R&D investments, so on and so forth. And all these are trained on um, a red cloud you know, here at for now. So it's not super powerful computation. It's a little bit slow. Um, but uh, at the same time, that means the model is actually just medium size. Uh, we as researchers can actually manage that rather than, you know, having to worry about what's going to happen um, if we don't have as much computation as, say, uh, OpenAI has. And here's the main architecture of, of our approach. We have two modules. One module is about the environment. We're going to build a sort of world model, right, of financial market environment. Why, why are we doing that? We want to know if we take a combination of actions, how is the environment going to respond, right? And then we can learn more about the environment. We can also try to optimize our policy for an objective. And, and at the same time, we also need a manager model which we call Alpha Manager Policy Module. That is uh, the reinforcement learning. Basically, we are solving, you, know, you can give me any objective. If I can write it in the form of cumulative rewards, um, which is written down here as you know, the sum of rewards over uh, rewards R over time. And XT are just the state variables. UT um, are the controls that the managers are trying to take actions about. And the actions and previous his, uh, system states are going to affect the evolution of the system states going forward. So for the environment module, uh, we use a three layer neural nets. Um, we're working on larger versions of that. So it's not too crazy, each layer is 300 neurons, so on and so forth, very standard functional form specifications. And for the policy module, where the manager is you know, taking taking actions, that is the UT, and that action and the states will affect the evolution of the environment. That action and states will also affect the reward that's generated for, for that time period. And by time period, what I really mean is quarter in our uh, empirical implementation. So those are the modules we have. And how, um, you know, I'm going to skip the training part. Um, the environment module is trained through supervised learning, and the policy module is trained through reinforcement learning that allows us to incorporate interactions and feedback effects of managers' decisions and the market environment. Um, one thing that I have to add is, again, how can I trust my environment module, the, the, the predictive environment module, PAM, is reliable? 
Well, in general, we, we don't know, right? Just like we can't interpolate or extrapolate too much when we have, you know, some, some reduced form um, identification. But we have to think about what type of um, uncertainties that, that we are facing. What if the data has shifted, right? Historically, because managers are all taking optimal actions, some space of the action um, it is just not explored. So we know very little. And our conjecture is that, you know, that's going to lead to model uncertainty. And that's what you know, uh, Tom Sargent and, and Lars Hansen and co-authors have done a lot of work on. So uh, we're going to use ambiguity uh, of the model to guide us to train the reinforcement learner, the policy model. The idea is if I train a bag of PEMS, a bag of environment modules, they all perform very well on the training data. Right? Typically, we'll have to figure out which one to select, but, but let's keep that whole bag. And when we move on to a test set uh, or a new data set, if they produce predictions that are very consistent, then we interpret that as the model has less ambiguity. But if there are big dispersions, essentially we're saying, even though these large models, deep learning uh, models, are very powerful in approximating almost any functional form, and we do you know, introduce a lot of parameters to train them well, um, it's still possible that with that big data, with that powerful computation, the algorithm is still not making a very consistent prediction. And the way robust control deals with that is, well, uh, we basically penalize the algorithm so that uh, we're telling alpha manager, you know, if you are not sure about your predictions, then try not to make recommendations around those dimensions. That, that's the basic idea. Now, the exact way of implementing um, such a robust control has discretion. Uh, we introduce some, you know, boosting arrow function. Uh, if the predictions that that gives the highest reward versus the lowest reward, if their gap is too big, we're going to uh, penalize the uh, in the reward function, and we're also going to take the environment module that gives us the worst reward. So in a way, we're really asking the algorithm to be ambiguity averse, and that's how we avoid getting into the regime where there's a lot of, you know, uh, endogeneity issues or unobserved um, actions in, in, in the historical data, which are more likely to lead to the models not being able to produce a consistent prediction. So that's the main idea. Now, how, how, would this, uh, how does this perform, right? If we look at the environment module, here I'm just showing you how they predict system state variable evolutions one quarter down the road. And uh, when I say ignore controls, that means we take out the managerial actions for that quarter, because to outside investors, these are not observed until later, right? They are observed with a lab. Uh, with control will be including those uh, nine dimensions of actions. And in terms of the R square uh, of firm outcomes that we can explain, uh, you do see this is definitely higher than 10%, uh, even out of sample. Um, but, but, but in addition, or even more importantly, we see that some, some control variables or control actions are more important in explaining the variations in firm outcomes. That means along those dimensions, managerial decisions matter more, right? Um, so that's something uh, that's worth exploring further. And we can also check you know, whether this is consistent with the causal patterns or reduced form insights that we have in the literature. Another exercise that we can do with the environment module is, you know, it, it doesn't have to be always about high dimensional actions. Let's think about simple low dimensional recapitalization exercise that shows up in many corporate finance textbooks. Right? You can raise equity of that, put that into cash or R&D or investment. What I'm showing you here is, if my goal is to maximize enterprise value uh, in the next quarter, and taking these different policy, uh, policy actions, which one is going to give me the highest performance? Well, it turns out that 
raising equity and investing that is going to maximize enterprise value the most uh, from the left panel. The left panel is basically a you know, uh, raising additional financing and putting it into investment. The red panel are policies three and four, which are just capital structure decisions, right? You can reduce that, increase equity, or uh, reduce cash, put that into investment. So, so we can do this type of exercise. Um, there's very rich heterogeneity we can look into. What type of firms um, are, are more predictable uh, in terms of ambiguity? What type of firms or what type of state variables um, uh, you know, give us or allow us to use the environment module to make better predictions um, for the system evolution. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip that and just touch on one more thing, and then I'll uh, conclude. So far, I've, I've talked a lot about the environment model, right? What about the policy model? What about the optimal actions that Alpha Manager is going to recommend? In the paper, we explore four different objectives, but you can give us alternative objectives as well. But the four that we explore are next quarter market cap changes, market cap increases, enterprise value increases, and next two year market cap increases and enterprise increases. Now, again, you can, you can give me alternatives. And what we find is, for example, over the using the short term objective, next quarter market cap increase or next quarter enterprise value increase, the alpha manager recommended action can outperform historical actions um, by you know, quite a few percent, right? And uh, if you use the longer horizon two-year objective, the performance um, is still there. That is not to say that the recommended action would be optimal. Suppose we use the one quarter short horizon objective and, and then come up with optimal recommendations of combinations of actions it actually is going to slightly underperform over four quarters. So short-termism, even though it's optimal for that short-term objective, is not optimal for the longer term, not too surprising. And um, in terms of the actions recommended, right? Here, I'm just going to give one uh, illustration. If we want to maximize the next quarter market cap, relative to historical actions, Alpha Manager is going to recommend that the manager does more acquisitions, increase cash holdings, pay out more dividend, increasing investment, so on and so forth. Um, you, you can say, you know, maybe using maybe maybe we are using the wrong objective, um, or um, let me just say, flag in my power here. My laptop is running on the battery side of that. You might say that the objective is um, different. That's fine. But as long as you give a objective, we can figure out the optimal action recommendation. Now in the paper, we, we explore a few more um, directions in terms of how we can use the ambiguity measure to figure out along what dimensions, along what decisions we would need more, um, we would need more knowledge to our reduced form analysis, total analysis of structural estimation, and along what other dimensions with large enough data and computation, we can pretty much solve all the problems. And in terms of incorporating insights from existing models or uh, structural models or theory models or reduced form models, the idea is you can use those models to produce data and utilize transfer learning to incorporate those data into the uh, DDRC framework. The key is how we weigh the data, right? If we have a merger acquisition observation, we only have three firms going through that, and we have uh, 3,000 firms. Those type of actions, in a way, are the weak factor equivalents in corporate finance. It's hard to pick them up in the data. And we can use ambiguity to weigh those data um, in order to incorporate those. So uh, I'm, I'm over time, so I'll just stop here and uh, I look forward to uh, waste discussion. Sorry for the scramble with the power. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Will, for presenting this very ambitious paper. Uh, Wei, um, you have uh, 20 minutes uh, for your discussion. You can share your slides. <clears throat> Thank you. Does it work well? Yeah. Yes, it's perfect. Yep. Looks Great. Good. Thank you so much for inviting me to this uh, cutting edge and the cross disciplinary forum. Uh, really an honor. Uh, it's not an easy uh, job to do because you think about when you're invited to be a discussant to the conference, you have 10 minutes. Very easy to kill. You start with this super interesting paper, end up with I recommend everybody to read it. In between, people something about endogeneity and suggest some level of standard error clustering. Now, here I have 20 and then no regression. So none of these tactics would work, have been more innovative. Um, but I truly enjoy this assignment um, because I get this opportunity to share my experience and thoughts as an aspirant uh, reader. Um, I would point out along the way uh, where I would like to learn more uh, in the scientific discovery process with the authors and, and other colleagues. And I would like to think together with the authors and interested scholars in this field, uh, importantly, where uh, this line of research uh, could be heading because I clearly see a, a new trend and the authors are, are, um, um, are heading, uh, are taking a leading position in this, uh, in this new direction. Now, uh, I think, you know, we have to put this paper in, in the perspective about the nature and objective and the path of corporate finance research. Now, corporate finance research is mostly about um, both analyzing as well as guiding corporate managers to make decisions to satisfy whatever objectives we, uh, either shareholders or society, want them to do. Now, the corporate managers face extremely, almost infinitely dimensional information inputs. And they apply not just non-linear, more accurately, they apply a number, some non-parametric uh, decision rules because no manager will write up a quadratic function as something plug in the value, but managers apply to principles, intuitions, experience, taking advice. You can all think about those are non-parametric inputs uh, based on the state variables and objections. Now, more importantly, Managers interact with the environment and they learn from their successes and failures. And, and that part traditionally has not been incorporated into empirical research, the feedback and, and reinforced learning part. Now, this is what managers do. Now we flip over and ask ourselves, hey, what do we corporate finance researchers do? We are here to explain, predict, and guide corporate governances. And we have a finite set of covariates. You know, once you have more than 10 regressors, the referee call, call, call you out for a kitchen sink regression. So you're pretty much reflected to up to 10 covariates. Um, we're restricted to adopt the very tractable, parametric, and oftentimes linear, occasionally highly specific structural model if you want to incorporate some nonlinearity. And we usually ignore feedback effects because it's not straightforward how to incorporate in, in empirical estimation. Um, these all have changed and the author's effort at making, uh, making a major contribution in, in facilitating some change. The first is that abundant data become available to researchers. Uh, and, and we are, especially in, in, in the new age of alternative data, we are facing non-structured infinite dimensional data ourselves. Now, the second is that we build machines that can increasingly think like human beings, but they think with less bias and more clarity and a high efficiency. And perhaps, you know, if this line the research is going as, as, as well as working toward, maybe eventually our corporations could be autopilot. We'll see whether, uh, whether um, to what extent that could happen, at least in, in some ways, okay? Uh, so let me summarize what I learned from reading the paper as a key elements of the methodology. So, so this is about reinforced learning. Okay, so it's it's a relatively new 
uh, technique compared to the, the now quickly become old school machine learning technique uh, is that it does not require label data. Uh, so it's, it's kind of offshoot of unsupervised learning, but more importantly, you can learn from the feedback without explicit instructions in the form of rewards. Okay, and sometimes even the rewards you can specify in a very flexible way. Now it allows sequential decision making so that each decision, not only making a decision, but you also change the surroundings. You're changing state variables now in the future and, and, and future decisions as well. Now, the sort part is that it's very dynamic. It can ask the machine to simulate a managerial decision that aiming at some long-term goal with specified cumulative rewards, not, not a static game or, 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 or a, a limited period game. Now, uh, we all might disagree, but in my view, I find the bigger contribution of this paper in terms of methodology is actually from ambiguity aversion. Because if the challenge is not about efficiency, machine can learn this, can reinforce that. It, it's about how do we view which one is the real calibration of the real world, which world we really live in, which model we should really believe in. Now, a priori, we usually do not have any of that, much of that information. And I like the fact that they are, they applying the Hansen and Sargent, you know, it reminds me of, I read, studied the working paper version of the initial paper, Hansen Sargent 2001, uh, when I was in grad school. And I, I, I found it was quite fascinating, but to me, it was a very, very abstract and a theoretical, um, exercise. So it's quite a reflection to learn like 25 years down the road, the group of researchers actually take it very seriously introducing to a domain that is that is currently dominated by traditional um, econometrics. Because this is something that allow us to retrieve the full freedom and flexibility of, of the modeling that will overcome the reduced form, the down modeling part, and the high specificity of the structural model. So, so this combination, I would think that I make analogy, this is not exact analogy, but think about when we run mini regressions, we're trying to uncover the first order relation between outcome and observable variable, treating this as a first order Taylor expansion, right? So now we're entering a new world that we are doing this dynamic optimization. And we're trying to, and we're not interested in reaching a, a full closed form solution but we want to be able to have an input output model, whatever objective inputs I have, I can spit out an output assessment. I think that's that's the direction that this methodology is going. So if I just going back to a little bit of, of, of a history now, I'm, I was like, let's let's just take an example, okay? So at time T, a firm with fundamental X, you can think about leverage, our A, facing environment, Z, interest rate, market portfolio, and CEO wants to know, if I were increase the dividend by one penny, now this model is infinitesimal change because it will not apply to global changes. So if I were just increase my dividend by one penny, how much my enterprise value will change? Now here's where where we should be proud to see how far we have gone. Because in the 1960s, researchers would just regress the change in, in, in the panel data, change in enterprise value on changing dividend. Okay? In the 1980s, Researchers started to conduct event studies. Hey, let's look at, you know, maybe 50 episodes of some lumpy dividend changes and let's capture the event window uh, return. Okay, now in, in, in the post, post 2000s, we use instruments such as the sudden death of CEO, try to isolate some exogenous component dividend change and do the estimation. Now, post 2010s, I observed that two trends of progress one is look around the world, usually now farther away from the US, the more likely you're going to find some shocks, some quasi random shocks, such as tax policy changes, you apply different there. Okay. Now, another branch say, hey, let's model dividend payout. It's optimal response to assumed and a highly parametric objective function and specify a very limited action space. Let's solve the model and estimate the structure. Okay. So that's. That's where we have been. I, I know that all the PhD students here say, gee, I wish I, I were born in the 1960s or 80s into this profession. But remember at that time, you didn't have iPhone, TikTok. Okay, so this is now we look at what this new method is going to accomplish. Okay, so this method is going to predict dividend payment using the standard, the methods are new, but the principles are old, basically the training predicting uh, procedure. Now, 
the, the advanced part of this methodology is a managerial reward function is left non-parametric. And also the resulting decision rule is also non-parametric, but you assume it's a some kind of optimizer, okay? Now, the, the, the upside is that it's so flexible, you can, you can really know if you get a reliable solution, it's not model specific. Now, the downside is that you really don't know what the internal reasoning is. It's, it's mostly a black box, something I will um, um, comment on later, okay? So you can basically using the RL reinforced learning model to solve a stochastic control problem, but without explicitly estimate all the process. You just want to be able to answer questions once you give a question. It's almost like you're building up a model to allow a prompt and output, okay? But you're not revealing the internal calculation uh, process the way that regression does, okay? So and another one I find that the best refinement of the model is that when you have multiple decision rules from multiple environments that fit the training sample roughly equally well, the authors are using a, a entropy penalty, which is minimize the disagreement among the models in the out of sample. I think that's no, that's 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 a very critical refinement of the model. Now. I think, you know, my guess is that when the disagreement is large, when the penalty is binding, I'm not sure that uh, that estimation, that answer to that question is reliable. I think that's still a trade-off, you know, I, I don't know whether the author agree with that, but that's, that's, my, uh, that's my understanding. So with this framework, you can estimate the change in objective functions such as enterprise value that will result from a, 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 dividend, a dividend change. But not only that, you can even inform differential outcomes based on different paths leading to a dividend change. So you can liquidate assets, borrow money, or reduce, uh, reduce retain earning. And, and you, for, it's like you're putting the prompts and also can tell you each one how what the outcome will be. So I, I found that's, that part to be, to be quite cool. So what I would like to learn more, the first is the objective function, because I, I still think because it's so unrestricted, it also limits my ability to really understand well. Now, researchers are usually have some well-defined outcomes. So for example, I want to maximize enterprise value, right? But the manager's reward function could be something else, right? So what is estimated by the model is manages real reward function, but that real reward function cannot be exported from the model to the researcher. Okay, so it is, it is a black box. So how would, I would like to see a clearer articulation about how this method will reconcile uh, with the assumed objective and an outcome where the objective was not the maxim, maximizing objective. So I, I think, you know, how do you know it's lack of skill? How do you know it's intention? How do you know it's incentive misalignment? So I found that part will be super rich and, and, and deserve some more uh, discussion. Now, for example, if we want to estimate the effect of acquisition of enterprise value, but the manager's objective is empire building. But the training sample, the managers are very honest to shareholder servants. Now, how, how do I deal with that, that problem? Okay. How do I deal with that? There's, there's a misalignment problem from the training sample to the, to the, to the estimation sample. Uh, and also, if I look at this chart, okay, so number three, pass number three is raising $1 to buy back equity, basically have a recapitalization, right? And you see it's dramatically negative, meaning whatever management has, if, if management were doing this, would be destroying value. So is it sufficient to conclude if such a manager is doing such a thing we observe? Uh, is it to what extent we are confident to conclude, hey, that management is destroying value, or it, it, it its model is missing something, or 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 due to something else? Okay. Now the second question, I think the big question mark I have is where do omitted variables go? Because that's you know I'm trying to map in the issues in traditional uh, corporate finance econometrics to the new methods. So I see it you all. Know, one issue I got is off, okay? Most endogeneity arises in from, it's a choice. It's, I don't randomly take action. I take action because it's a choice. Okay, that part is resolved because you precisely model the action as my optimizing choice. So that part of endogeneity is subsumed by, by this new methodology. Now, part of the endogeneity is due to omitted variables and asymmetric information. So what if, the information that management relied, relied on uh, uh, on the action 
uh, supposed to say private benefits of control is perfectly observable to the management and partially observable to the market. So they have formed certain stock uh, reactions, but unobservable to the researcher. But when you have this different, uh, different information, uh, um, um, different one information is a proper subset or super sub, super sub something else. How would you deal with this reference when different parties have different information set, especially between the management and the outcome producer, the stock market, and 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 the econometrician? Okay, so 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 I the next bullet I also ask question: How am I supposed to estimate the 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 um the the incidents when when uh the 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 management uh with private benefits with control how he's going to pay a dividend but I estimate from the manage the population of managers with differential private benefits control okay suppose you cannot really really capture okay now the the second one uh, the third one I think you know it's not a, a critique but it, it it's really uh, a curiosity and also direction the paper can go and could expand to multiple papers um is that Will this paper, will this methodology allow to construct an AI board or AI analyst master because they, they have slightly different functions? Um, so it's to my impression that this is a very nice framework that we can systematically and periodically estimate the counterfactuals of all corporate actions, not only corporate actions, but also corporate non-actions, because you know, in the model, non-action is, is action. So we can estimate of average, you know, corporate over in this time that the corporations are average over levered. Um, in that time, the corporation are over acquiring, etc. Now, I have less optimism, at least the current stage of the model, that this could be used to assess individual firm. Okay. So, for example, if you tell me. Currently, retail industry is over levered because if you take one dollar from debt to equity, you would you know increase value. I I think you will be able to do that. Now, will the model correct correctly form an assessment whether the first ever dividend payment by matter last month was optimal? I'm I'm less confident because the training data would have very different structure from uh from the matter. But I still think at the group stage this method can already do a lot because we can sort firms into different objective functions we can tell hey this firm is a shareholder value maximizer and this firm is a, is a, is a, is an empire builder and we actually can tell whether firms take actions are they aligned or misaligned with the shareholder value and you can even have a trading trading um, algorithm based on it because you know, instantly you know whether a, a action is destroying value, enhancing value, you can trade on it. But I'm also very interested to learn, um, does the market reaction, does the market get it? And, and the market get it, need how much long to get it? Okay, so, so this is, I think it's super cool things to do and really open up a new chapter in corporate finance research based on this methodology. Okay, my last, last slide and my last um, 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 comment. So, I think, you know, as another final word, sorry, final word, okay? So so I really want to see some norm setting because for today, machine learning AI have inevitably become the new regressions. So the regressions, not see they're disappearing, but they're more leaving way to machine learning and, and AI. Now, regressions, we have many, many decades of, of, of experience. We have a set of pretty robust standards when the author shows something, we know that you have to have this fixed effect, or that cluster standard error, how much data procedure to disclose in the paper, what replication hits to share, etc. But because of the newness of the methodology, the norms for the ML AI research is still under construction. But I think this group of authors have the financial ability and possibly ambition to shape this protocol so that we can all make progress together. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Wei, for um, a great a great discussion. Um, we now are going to have some time for uh, for questions from, from the audience. So please submit your questions in the QA. There's one question, but before, uh, Will, do you want to take a minute to respond to Wei? 
Sure. Yeah. Th thank you, Wei, for the for the great discussion. And uh, you know, all the points are well taken. We actually are thinking along the directions that that you suggested. Uh, may not be able to put all that into one paper, but but for, for example, right, the um, objectives. Here, when we say the alpha manager is recommending a more optimal action than the historical actions, we are taking a stand, right? You are giving me an objective. Um, but what if they have different objectives? So one way to do that is, we, which we actually have some results is, you can introduce a inverse reinforcement learner. Basically, you give me a few candidate objectives, right? ESG objectives, managerial compensation, you know, enterprise value. And if we believe the historical actions uh, were optimal, and uh, we use reinforcement learner to figure out the optimal policy, then we can at the same time figure out what ways the managers must be putting on these different objectives. And uh, it, it essentially, you know, you, you form a generative adversarial network. You have a reinforcement learner and inverse reinforcement learner kind of on the technical side, but, but that's one way to figure out um, managerial objectives. And, um, you know, uh, are firms' actions aligned or not? Those questions can be better answered in that in that setup. Um, in terms of omitted variables and information asymmetry, um, th that is something uh, that is a limitation of of the model. In a way, the model gives a average recommendation to the managers, but presumably the managers has managers have more information, and they have you know things that are not in the information set of uh, Acknowledgements. Um, so, so this will be more of a guidance, right, like in terms of utility to the industry side. Um, along the line that you suggested, we can look into more heterogeneity. I don't think we can get to individual firms, but maybe groups of firms. What type of actions would be better? You know, what what objectives they must be utilizing. And just one thing that I I would like to add, which is also related to to these great comments, is to the researchers to corporate finance researchers. Um, I think one potential utility is just, you know, we can always write down a simple model. We can always pick a few variables, right, to test the model in corporate finance. But how do we know if these models are all, are all coherent and all that, right? So, so how do we put them all together? And I think the um, ambiguity part is not the perfect solution, but it does tell us something, oh, you know, there are certain dimensions if you give me data and computation, that's enough. You know, uh, actually, whether it's supply driven or demand driven, the outcomes are all kind of similar or consistent. But there are other dimensions. We really need theory. We really need to understand the underlying mechanism. We really need causality. Um, that would help us to focus our effort uh, a bit more, hopefully. Um, and and uh, earlier on, I mentioned how to piece together this. Uh, knowledge and insights that we, we have in the literature. Um, it, it's something that this might be helpful. Again, this is an engineering attempt, right? Like you can use ambiguity to weigh these insights. Um, it's not going to be an optimal solution, but an initial step towards that direction. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Um, I will ask the, the uh, questions from the q and I do have one follow-up questions because it's very related to the point yeah. you just made, right? Like kind of that, um, I'm curious, um, have you tried uh, to explore how sensitive your, the main insights are to kind of the choices that you can make in, with uh, full robust control, right? Like for example, the specification of the boosting error, do you see that, you know, oh, you know, it, it, it's kind of the ambiguity part can put the spotlight on where theory is more needed or when you reduce form is, is more needed, but how sensitive um, are these insights uh, that, you know, I think are super interesting, how sensitive are they to kind of some of those decisions you need to make to estimate the ambiguity? Yeah, uh, that, that's a great question. Um, that's actually a dimension that it's very hard to put quantitative assessment in the sense that there are um, there is discretion in the type of penalty function we impose, right? For each one, um, the, the model will make some predictions and we're evaluating it on the prediction um, that, that the model is making. So in a way, it's a model-based evaluation because these counterfactual actions or it did not happen in the historical data. Um, so that's not, not answering the question much, right? It's hard to, to evaluate. I think one way to go is to do it online. 
actually when you have new data coming in, right, picking the optimal policy, you can kind of deliver as a manager at least, you can explore certain dimensions of action, certain combinations of action that will, would allow you to either reduce the ambiguity or to, to figure out, you know, was that ambiguity or version effective? Um, but it's going to be a costly learning, right? Like I have to try the policy and that's going to be very, very costly uh, with online data, basically, if we run this in, in practice. Um, for econometricians, I guess the, the equivalent would be, we really need to set aside a true test sample that, that there's no way that we can, we can look at, right? And see how it performs. I mean, we can do that. Uh, it's just that it's hard to claim that's the true test sample um, because, um, I mean, that applies to uh, all these models, right? Oh, how do we guarantee that we, we have a look at that yet? All right. So thank you. Thank you, Will. So there's a, um, a few questions in the in the Q&A. The first one is about uh, strategic interactions and equilibrium. So the question is, you know, firms compete with uh, each other. Their actions are strategic substitutes or complements. How can the framework, right, the TDRC framework, incorporate the strategic interactions among firms and characterize the equilibrium of the corporate finance games? Embedding the single firm problem in an equilibrium model would unlock important yeah. insights. Yeah, uh, th th that's a very relevant question. Uh, as an initial step, we're just treating, you know, this as a average firm decision, right? Mm -hmm. Almost like a single firm. Yeah. So there's not as much interaction uh, among the firms, except through the way that firms aggregate action affect the, the, the macro states. The kind of, the firm is interacting with the environment. Um, one one interesting direction, which I am not sure is going to take off in in the economics discipline, is uh, agent based modeling. Right, you can introduce multiple uh, reinforcement learners as separate firms and just simulate the entire economy. Um, I think that's that's a popular approach in in physics or OR, um, potentially useful here, right, to to solve that uh, issue. Again, not in closed form, but providing us some basic patterns and insights. And um, I, I kind of also uh, read the other the other question uh, that, that is saying, you know, the approach lacks micro foundations, so theoretical models, right, to specify the channels and mechanisms. Absolutely. DDRC is on, on the other end of the spectrum. So it's not as transparent and it's not telling us much about the underlying mechanisms. Um, so so uh, I, 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 I don't view that as too negative. It's effective in producing counterfactuals and making policy recommendations. It's actually going to complement our other approaches, right? It's going to provide patterns and points to areas where we can do more theoretical work. We can look for more causality um, in order to understand the underlying mechanism. And if you want to incorporate those theoretical models, again, the, the basic idea is very simple. If we truly believe in that theory model, use that model to generate data, and then use the ambiguity to weigh that data, and, and, and put all that as pre-training for the model, right? just like what uh, ChatGPT has, right? There's a pre-trained model, and then you can do the, the fine-tuning using true historical data, or even the feedback that economists provide to the system. Um, but but that's, that's outside the scope. Of uh, of this initial uh, step, initial attempt. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Wei. Thanks so much to um, to both of you. Um, big round of, of applause. We are going to enter the unrecorded part of um, of the webinar. Before uh, we do that, we'd just like to make a, a quick announcement for our next webinar, which will be um, on May 30th. And we'll have Andrea Asfield from UCLA, who will present her work on generative AI and firm value, and Anastasia Fedek um, uh, from Berkeley, who will be uh, the discussant. So you can uh, um, stick around if you'd like to be upgraded to a panelist, and then you'll have a chance to interact directly and exchange with Will um, and Wei if you have additional questions. Thank you very much, everyone. Mm -hmm.